Hideo Kojima's Metal Gear Solid V Ground Zeroes is easy to overlook. But more than mere stepping stone to its bigger brother, The Phantom Pain, Ground Zeroes was deceptively groundbreaking all on its own. In this video, we'll provide some of the context for Ground Zeroes, focusing specifically on the real mid-20th century history that the game evokes as its way of beginning to comment on much more recent events. Ground Zeroes, though ostensibly set in March of 1975, positively teams with imagery alluding to the most notorious terror attack in history, which would not occur, of course, for 26 years, 5 months, and 27 days, from the game's set date of March 16th, Zero Hour. Playing out inside a version of America's notorious detainment camp at the southern tip of Cuba, established after those attacks, Ground Zeroes, a terrific and terribly visceral game, culminates in the destruction of the player's own home base, as we watch towers of steel and glass inwardly collapse to cough out plumes equal parts smokescreen and conspiracy. The result will be a storytelling style, if not story, in fact, far removed from concrete truths. Outside the player's newly narrowed range of perception, let alone agency, where real or rather externally verifiable events go the way of the dodo. No surprise that proposal submitted to the Pentagon was a pack of lies. Leaving in their wake only maddening phantom sense of how peace and freedom and strength used to taste. All of this tellingly opens under the auspices of a nuclear inspection, another clear and present danger that Ground Zeroes is secretly all about the war on terror. Silence her before we're compromised? No, I've got something else in mind. Our friends at Cypher suspect Pass could be a double agent. She's being held for interrogation at a camp on the southern tip of Cuba. Black site, nice. A slice of American pie on communist soil and out of U.S. legal jurisdiction. The upcoming inspection of Mother Base has to be connected somehow. The timing's too perfect. Saddam Hussein and his regime will stop at nothing until something stops him. Powell argued Iraq is deceiving the weapons inspectors. This was a typical American show, complete with stunts and special effects. We'll have to set aside the really obvious questions for now, like why the MGS5 project in general, starting with Ground Zeroes, so fully embraces anachronisms and time paradoxes, something MGS3 is legendary for avoiding. Apart from the use of the Cuban facility as a detainment center, clearly Ground Zeroes is deliberately a paradox. And the exact reasons for that we'll have to just wait to discuss, which go into the novel 1984 and what that novel had to say about the concept of an objective past that we can visit at any time in the present. To quote Winston Smith from Orwell's 1984, history has stopped, and as he must himself learn by the novel's end, the past exists only via the present tense of the living mind. The same era of asymmetrical sectarian post-colonial police wars definitive of today in the early 21st century, all that began right here in the mid-1970s, some 50 years before. Ground Zero's most explicit act of political invective is its tacit premise even time itself has become a hostage, a detainee here, in this concentration camp without a name. Ground Zero's as a whole is a kind of prison, even if it's in a disguised sense, a prison we only imagine someday escaping. Playing out in loops across a 24-hour cycle from main operation to side ops, players see the grounds of the so-called detainment center Camp Omega like prisoners would from every possible time of day as we fulfill our mindless recreation and serve out our sentence, hopefully only awaiting death by the end. All this seems to be punishment for the character Big Boss 
who deviated so far from the will of the shadowy group behind all events, the ultimate antagonists in Metal Gear games, Cypher, later to be called the Patriots. Trapped here in our state of indeterminate rendition, recalling former Secretary of Defense Donald Rumsfeld's infamous request in the form of Gitmo Cuba for somewhere effectively in outer space to store undesirables like so much nuclear waste. The player experiences the first inklings of the type of scenarios here later to be featured in the follow-up game, The Phantom Pain. We have to track assassination targets, gather intelligence, sabotage the enemy, and so forth. All this works together as an interactive snapshot, though, also of a police state. A kind of creeping neo-totalitarianism, the atmosphere of Orwell's novel nakedly pulsating darkly in the shade and the rain-beaten squalor, the sadomasochism, a totalitarianism that assails us with signs and warnings across the base that coldly inform us in signature Kojima irony, no POVs admitted here. With no clear understanding and no agency to do anything about it, we're left like any typical political prisoner to simply wait for the bullet to the back of the skull we know is as good as preordained. Even if it lurks off in the dark, only rarely allowing us a direct look, there's a despair, a total helplessness, a sort of nihilistic fatalism to Ground Zeroes that few Big Banner action game franchises would dare to attempt. Simply put, the game is like a thought crime scream into the void it, it itself so penetratingly obscures that American abyss. Its is a darkness most survival horror titles cannot hope to even match, and yet Ground Zeroes brings a dread that is essentially wordless as it is immense, a black panic that suffocates all reason, a stinking fear that smells as it blurs, blots, or blurts out all sense of time or place simultaneously. Just as the game's setting is a version of Gitmo, the wider game itself puts us in a version of Orwell's Ministry of Love, the place from which there is no escape, where no one returns from the same. Instead of Airstrip 1 Oceania, we are in South Bay Tactical Airstrip, property of the US government. But hold on, what about on a more basic level? Well, narrative-wise, Ground Zeroes depicts the operatic tragedy and sin of that most Wagnerian of themes, the myth of the backstab. Played like a damn fiddle, players can only watch by the main scenario's end as the private army we spent the entire previous title Peace Walker building gets destroyed, depriving us of all, we're told, but a lust for Old Testament-style retribution. Ground Zeroes alludes to the Iliad with good reason, as it could be construed as a partial retelling or spiritual heir to that story of the sacking of Troy. Trojan horse is in. Yet all this lust for revenge, as we'll see by the Phantom Pain, of course, only plays into Skullface, our mystery-drenched annihilator's hands. Ground Zeroes evokes the idea of us being effectively emptied like vapor, then filled back in with themselves, with the party, the dystopian totalitarian force behind the events of the game, filling us in with their mentality, the mentality of those who first poisoned and destroyed us to begin with. Hijacking the logic of infectious disease, MGS5 as a whole poisons us with its venom, a poison that will blot out reason's sun, and in the darkness in its wake deprived of serving in heaven, we'll try our hand in outer heaven at the next best thing, ruling in hell. The host unit of Omega, or more precisely, of the nameless infernal tomb surrounding Camp Omega, are the not 666th, but 999th Operational Support Air Regiment. Mirrors will come to haunt us throughout the MGS-5 experience. Mirrors and mirrored things. But all that's for another time. We're here to discuss Ground Zeroes as a reflection, or rather interpretation, of the 1970s and how it suggests a common link between that era and the era of the early 21st century, known as the War on Terror. 
Simply put, the game wants to target the exact hypothetical or symbolic point that the post-Cuban Missile Crisis age of de-escalation and detente descended into the conditions that would one day end the Cold War and conjure its phantom, the age of the War on Terror. And we'll see this is in virtually every element of the game. Ground Zeroes begins story-wise with a phony nuclear inspection, like I said. This coincides with a top-secret search and rescue operation, bringing us into the heart of what in all but name we recognize as the most infamous of all of America's many, many landmarks, the naval facility at Guantanamo Bay. The first landmark, I should note, of the 21st century other than Ground Zero, where the Twin Towers once stood. These might be the two Ground Zeroes, the two sites of collapse. This we can see just in how much that collapse of our offshore base at the end of the game positively drips with bloody imagery clearly inspired by the collapse of the World Trade Center. Terrorism triggering a permanently arrested state of police emergency. That's what Ground Zeroes ultimately depicts. But of course, this should be a contradiction. The 1970s was the peak era of peace, the era when the American military industrial complex seemed on its last leg. The catch is how purposely fast and loose that this game is playing with history, if we think of history as a sort of timeline, or as something as objective as math. All this is to just drive Ground Zero's deepest ideas home. The 1970s and the early 21st century are more similar than they may at first seem, though. Everything I'm about to say is perfectly evocative of both eras. A status quo of indefinite detention and black site torture, of knocked and nebel disappearances, tit-for-tat, tet-a-tet offensives of terrorism on terrorism, Soviet gulag-style re-education. It's just that in the early 21st century, this is going on in a different part of the world, no longer as it was in the 70s in Indochina. We've established that there is some kind of connection, but why, right? Well, all this has to do with the new status quo that fighting and losing Vietnam would bring about. Boss, the mission objective is to eliminate two U.S. Marines officials. The pair were in Laos together, but retired after the U.S. withdrew its forces. The facility's inmates wouldn't be limited to just prisoners, but anyone they considered a threat, rendition from around the world under the designation of enemy combatants. This plan goes beyond the current paradigm of nation states. But is something like this really the world without borders that Cypher wants? Let's not forget that all, or nearly all anyway, of the major cast of characters behind the so-called coming war on terror and its invasion and occupation of countries like Iraq and Afghanistan these characters from Donald Rumsfeld to Richard Dick Cheney and even the father and son twin towering George Bushes, all these people were getting their start around the setting of Ground Zeroes, 1975. The neoconservative movement was a direct reaction to the failures and the scandals of Watergate and the end of Vietnam. Neoconservatives are, of course, the party who were in power, who created the whole concept of a war on terror after 9-11. The awful legacy of secret wars and death squads, of enemy renditions, torture, enhanced interrogations, and assassinations, it all goes back, in the U.S.'s case, to the Vietnam War, and also crucially to the proxy wars in this period being fought by East and West throughout Latin America. This was all the result, indirectly, of the logic of nuclear deterrence past the Cuban Missile Crisis, which took place here in Cuba 11 years before and not like the nine years that will divide Ground Zeroes from the Phantom Pain. This era of proxy wars and secret wars was caused, you could say, from the paradigms of the open society, the peace of the early information age, and the concept of the rule of law. Wars no longer permitted, legally, to play out in grand theaters out in the open, more or less, retained their flair for the cinematic and orchestral by becoming more secretive, as they became more in nature psychological, became as wars of mental domination directed not only against foreign populations and adversaries, but against the superpowers as own peoples. Many of the biggest nuclear treaties and agreements emerged in at least embryonic form by the mid-20th century, as starting with the Atoms for Peace initiative in the 1950s, nuclear energy transitioned from closely guarded state secret to something America spread around as freely and inclusively as the McDonald's hamburger. 
But this introduction of peaceful nuclear power worldwide never came with teeth with a fully independent and international watchdog. This underscores how the shared nuclear power policy was itself part of the Cold War's mind war, a mind war that nukes had brought about, catalyzing their evolution in an endless shower of radiation waves, remnants like plutonium or phantom pain lingering in the stratosphere of our minds, of our cultural collective. The IAEA actually lacks much agency whatsoever in setting up surprise inspections or seriously policing the proliferation of nuclear weapons unilaterally, even today. Yet for most people of a certain age, the IAEA and the subject of nuclear inspectors remain synonymous in our memories mainly with one regime, one face, Iraq, that is to say Babylon's own Saddam Hussein. Um, in fact, Metal Gear Solid 2 originally would have depicted just that, an Iraqi nuclear inspection. Since the Israeli sneak attack on Iraq's covert nuclear plant during Operation Opera 1981, the Ba'athist dictator would be the subject of repeated anti-PR campaigns by Western officials desperate to justify war on the oil-rich renegade, admittedly tyrannical and despotic state. Nearly all of these campaigns hinged on ruse inspections of some degree or another, or at least politically motivated ones, starting from the end of the first Iraq war in 1991 to the start of the second one in 2003. Inspections that would be called off by that point, only as it was becoming clear they were starting to actually work. Here's a picture of how things before the Cold War's end played out, though. That's Saddam Hussein shaking hands with U.S. Ambassador and major player in this story, Donald Rumsfeld. There is a direct link to be drawn from our player character, the dictator, strongman, big boss, and temporary allies to U.S. foreign policy objectives like Pol Pot to Manuel Noriega, from Saddam Hussein to perhaps to a limited point even to say figures like Osama bin Laden. Though of course Osama bin Laden, a wealthy Saudi millionaire, was never really in need of American support financially. That's why it was so easy for him to pursue his own objectives. One side op assigned to our mercenary band by the Eastern Bloc is to assassinate a former Marine sniper spotter duo known by the Russian names Eye and Finger. They made a name for themselves in America's one and only true full-scale secret war, the one in Laos. The tacit connections being drawn here are between the modern black site practices made infamous by the CIA at Gitmo and the era that gave us Laos and the CIA's then infamous Phoenix program. The secret Laos operations would, in the words of a great place to have a war, the definitive expose on the subject, transform the CIA from loose collection of spies into a paramilitary operation and key player in American foreign policy, end quote. To quote the CIA's own declassified affidavits, courtesy of the University of Saskatchewan, the aforementioned Phoenix program's basic approach was the collection of operational information on members of the Viet Cong infrastructure at each Phoenix detention center, end quote. According to RedX.com, once a suspect was targeted, they would be arrested, interrogated, and kept in detention for up to two years without trial. Those detained were frequently subjected to torture and eventually died in custody, facilitating the systemic apprehension and killing of civilians, end quote. Though I should point out the exact nature and methods of the Phoenix program remain hotly contested, whereas the existence of the exact same setup and tactics by the Viet Cong remain historical fact. Whether fully fact or fiction, or something in between, phantoms of the Phoenix program rose anew in the white smoldering ashes of 9-11, cresting like a wave or flame relit. Ground Zeroes was making these cross-generational connections while hiding itself in plain sight. Well, the last comparison to make for now between the 1970s and early 21st century has to do with tapes. Yes, as weird as it may sound, tapes were still an important part of the puzzle. Following the 9-11 attacks, Bin Laden was very famous for putting out tapes. According to the Wilson Center, in December of 2001, CNN acquired some 1,500 audio tapes from Osama Bin Laden's former residence in Kandahar, Afghanistan. Bin Laden would frequently issue new messages on audio and video tapes. Interpreting these messages and the question of whether or not these interpretations were being skewed towards such and such foreign policy objectives, these were some of the controversies that surrounded the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 attacks. Whatever your interpretation of that or other events, there's no question that the scent of scandal, of corruption, unrestrained power, of crossing the proverbial Rubicon, 
It's all inherent to both the 1970s and the early 21st century. Not that I'm implying anything untoward about those attacks, by the way, just that the response to the attacks, whatever the cause, that was the true crossing of the Rubicon. Or at least for this YouTuber. Whether or not you buy into conspiracy theory, what's indisputable is the 2001 attacks were chain reaction effects of ripples first cast by the CIA and by extension the U.S. government's stones. Further, that the decision to respond to 9-11 by going to war, informally declared by the commander-in-chief by the end of the night, and to dig up links, true ones or otherwise, to Saddam Hussein, decided by the Secretary of Defense within several hours of the attacks. Not to mention the unilateral act of creating Gitmo as a legal, moral, and even existential black hole as the who's, what's, when's, and where's of this prison camp beyond the bounds of law itself, according to its own architects, became classified need to know only. As of 2022, the U.S. Department of Defense admits that of the 99 U.S. citizens captured in Afghanistan, at least one was housed for a time at Gitmo. The war on terror has decimated the very concept of civil liberty to the extent that younger generations seemingly take the sacrifice of individuality, and we could add to that privacy, political pluralism, and civic liberties, all for the sake of consensus and security, to be a given. In other words, the American people, or this, so MGS5 suggests, have been abused and traumatized by our own fathers, metaphorically speaking, our leaders, our own supposed selves, or the proxies of ourselves, our representatives as a republican democracy. Our spy services, and even military leaders, and some political leaders, in institutions like the Joint Chiefs of Staff, all the same names, and even some of the same faces as during Watergate and the collapse of Vietnam, they've arguably exploited the raw fact that we are powerless to stop them. They know this best, after all. They're the ones meant to do the protecting. Instead of guarding us, they've become, as it were, our prison guards, abusing us in the name, they tell us, of our own best interests. Keep all this in mind as we close out with a passage from Treating Adult Survivors of Childhood Abuse, Chapter 4, Disassociation. Disassociation is the process of severing connections between categories of mental events, between events that seem irreconcilably different, between the actual events and their effective and emotional significance, between active events and the awareness of their cognitive significance, and finally, as in the case of severe trauma, between the actual occurrence of real events and their permanent symbolic verbal mental representation. When a child is subjected over time to trauma, such as sexual abuse by a trusted parent, the enormity of the betrayal and of the physical and psychological violation is too great for the ego to tolerate. The continued survival of the child is felt to be at risk. To protect the self from such overwhelming fear of annihilation, which the Greeks, I should note, refer to as omega, and further, to shield oneself from cognitively knowing about the event, or events plural, the individual's experience of consciousness splits vertically, coexistent with the ego states that knows about the trauma and effectively reacts to it, is an ego state that, although somewhat depleted, is ignorant of the catastrophic events. And I'll stop here to just point out this sounds rather similar to a certain term from Orwell's novel, Doublethink. Let's go on. Traditionally, then, disassociation is defined as a process by which a piece of traumatic experience, because it is too overstimulating to be processed and recorded along the usual channels, is cordoned off and established as a separate psychic state within the personality, creating two or more ego states that alternate in consciousness and, under different internal and external circumstances, emerge to think behave, remember, and feel. Such disassociated states are associatively unavailable to the rest of the personality and as such cannot be subject to psychic operations of elaboration. The adult survivor of childhood abuse will experience the dissociated traumatic states in the form of memories of the trauma that are unavailable at other times, 
recurrent intrusive images connected to the trauma, but otherwise unrecognizable, violent or symbolic acting out, inexplicable somatic sensations, recurring nightmares, anxiety reactions, and psychosomatic conditions. Like the process it describes, disassociation was for a long time forgotten, occasionally popping up, but essentially unmodified or elaborated over time. The researcher Bromberg's moving description from 1991 states the following, Disassociated experience, thus, tends to remain unsymbolized by thought and language, exists as a separate reality outside of self-expression, and is cut off from authentic human relatedness and deadened to full participation in life, in the life of the rest of the personality. Meaningful existence in the present is preempted by the repetitive, timeless, traumatic past, and the present is little more than a medium through which this unprocessed past may be known." End quote. I submit to you that this may work both ways, that in other words, trauma can affect our memories as well as our dreams. The things we think about are coming, and the things that we think have already came. Things to come, and things that have already been. So if it's true that Ground Zeroes is presented as if it was through the perspective of someone seeing the 1970s from the early 21st century, it's the trauma that has stained these memories, making them paradoxical, making time into a much more literal sense of a flat circle. Or at least that's one possible interpretation. I could go on, but I think the basic point here has been made. The last point has to do with the all-defining paradigm of the age of terrorism that the Cold War spawned, the martyr. Beloved characters Chico and Paz, much like martyristic characters from Orwell's novel, Winston Smith and Julia, are taken from us, and none of the survivors of this trauma will ever be the same. Grief, loyalty, and sex gone sour, these epitomize Orwell's 1984, they epitomize Kojima's MGS5, and arguably, they epitomize the entirety of the 21st century so far. Ground Zeroes conjures all this context to mind, wrapping it all in a horrifying and paradoxical package that truly pioneered its own kind of science fiction espionage game design. Bringing the paranoia and nightmares of the sci-fi dystopian espionage genre to its apex, Ground Zeroes represents a crowning triumph both for the series and medium. If this video is popular enough, we'll revisit the game next time to investigate the side ops one by one. Alright, until next time, boss.